The views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the guests appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 8 News Now or Next Star Media Group. Tonight on Politics Now, the top two races in Nevada are both dead heats. We look at the latest public poll in the races for Senate and Governor. The way this has happened, there's a lot of misinformation, a lot of lost information. Democratic Congresswoman and Senate candidate Jackie Rosen talks to us about families separated at the border and legislation that will be coming out of the Problem Solvers Caucus. When you walk through the Nevada legislature, every other person there is an NV Energy lobbyist. One of the main advocates for the Energy Choice Initiative explains why its creators decided to do it by constitutional amendment and why he's certain about the effect it would have on prices. From 8 News Now, this is Politics Now with Steve Sebelius and Patrick Walker. The top two races in Nevada this year are essentially tied. That's according to a new poll published in the Reno Gazette Journal newspaper. Contests for U.S. Senate and the Governor's Mansion are both within one percentage point in the poll, which was conducted by Suffolk University. Incumbent Republican Senator Dean Heller leads his Democratic opponent, Congresswoman Jackie Rosen, 41 percent to 40 percent. And in the race for governor, Republican Attorney General Adam Laxalt is just barely ahead of his Democratic foe, Clark County Commissioner Steve Sisolak. That's 41.6 percent to 41 percent. And when you consider the poll's margin of error is 4.4 percent, it's clear these races are as close to tied as they can be. The race for governor is especially close when you consider that Laxalt is only ahead by one percentage point in swing Washoe County. That's where he lives. The Democratic path for success in statewide elections in recent years includes staying as even as possible in Washoe. In the race for U.S. Senate, however, Rosen trails Heller by nine points in Washoe County. She must make up that deficit if she has a chance to win in November. One bright spot for Rosen might be health care, which voters identified as their top issue in the Senate race. Heller's been criticized repeatedly because he pledged not to vote for a bill that took away health care provided by the Affordable Care Act before eventually voting for a failed repeal bill. Well, that poll also measuring people who are not on the ballot. So who are the most popular and least popular, at least the most popular and least popular officials in the state? Probably no surprise here. It's, uh, it, it, neither one is Donald Trump, by the way. Uh, the least popular person is former Senator Harry Reid. He had an unfavorable rating of 53%. The most popular person, Governor Brian Sandoval, he had a favor favorable rating of almost 57 percent. So I think the there. unfavorable was only like 21 percent. Yeah, something. he's, he's very, he remains very popular. Very few people don't like Brian Sandoval. Well, the House is on a break for a few weeks, and that means our delegation is back here in Nevada. A Democratic Congresswoman and Senate candidate Jackie Rosen held a health care roundtable on women's reproductive health on Tuesday. Rosen has also co-sponsored several bills in Congress recently, including one that would cap basic prescription drug prices at $250 per person or $500 for a family. After the roundtable, I sat down with Rosen and asked her about families separated at the border and legislation coming out of the Problem Solvers Caucus. The Trump administration and the separate family separation yeah. policy. We know of more and more families now, at least the adult part of the family that have been detained here in Nevada, yes. children are elsewhere. Yeah. Have you heard from, uh, from people calling your office asking for help that are here in Nevada trying to, to reunite with their kids? Uh, yeah, my office has been, has been in contact with ICE, with the Henderson Detention Center and others. I myself went down to the border, El Paso Juarez, and visited a detention center, uh, not, a camp, excuse me, a camp for um, minors. They were minor boys uh, separated mm -hmm. from their families in Tornillo. So what I want to say about that is the uncertainty of when they're going to be reunited, what's going to happen to them, uh, the capacity for them to have legal representation and services. It all matters, and this crisis is created by the president, and he can change it in an instant. So we don't need to continue to have these families separated. What we need to do is have this administration look at doing comprehensive immigration reform and stop with this reckless policies that tear families apart needlessly. He started it, he can stop it. Has your office been able to try at least get an idea of how many uh, people are detained here or how many would qualify into that category that have been separated or actually here in, in our state? You know what, we're working on getting that information. We just found out the other day that there were some families here. So uh, we're trying to obtain the status of the people that are here, whether they had children, whether they came alone, and uh, we're putting together that report. It seems to be with uh, uh, 
the way this has happened, there's a lot of misinformation, a lot of lost information, so we want to be sure before I say anything that we have the accurate record and accurate representation of what's going on here in Nevada. Problem Solvers Caucus? Oh, I'm... Join that. What yeah. are some of the things that you're working on that uh, possibly have a chance of making it to the president's desk? I will tell you one of the best things I ever did was become uh, one of the founding members of the Problem Solvers Caucus. We are a bipartisan caucus trying very hard to put forth position papers on issues that we all agree on. I'm on the infrastructure task force trying to talk about how we fix America's potholes, net neutrality, rural broadband, ports, roads and bridges, really important things that we agree on. How do we move that forward? And so problem solvers, we've done a great uh, uh, position paper. I think we're going to try to put some legislation behind it. It's called Break the Gridlock. So what happens in Break the Gridlock is we want to be sure is that every member has an opportunity for a bill to come to the floor for a vote. Or that if a bill has so many sponsors, bipartisan sponsors, it comes to the floor to the vote. And we're just not locked out because one speaker or one group can hold something hostage. Well, more of that interview is available on LasVegasNow.com, including questions about health care, Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh, and Yucca Mountain. Well, former President Barack Obama endorsed three Nevada Democrats running for House and Senate. Obama announced on Twitter Wednesday that he is endorsing Rosen and Congressional District 3 and 4 candidates Susie Lee and Stephen Horsford, respectively. The president's endorsements nationwide went to challengers in competitive districts. That explains why he skipped the dean of Nevada's congressional delegation, Congresswoman Dina Titus. North Las Vegas leaders were calling Tuesday historic, dignitaries breaking ground on a 12-mile pipeline to take water out to the Apex Industrial Park. It has been a long road to get to this point. One, two, three. <laughs> the solution to a decades-old problem is a pipe. For nearly 30 years, North Las Vegas has been looking for a way to get enough water out to the Apex Industrial Park to spur development. But with no big customers on the other end, it hasn't been worth the time and money to build it. So really solving that chicken and egg problem of, of bringing utilities out before there's businesses and then and it has been what we've been trying to solve out here. The nearly $50 million solution, a long pipeline tapping into North Las Vegas' water system. Just about right here where we stand, there's a, a large 36-inch pipe that has a, a, a big cap on the end of it with a whole bunch of, of uh, bolts and it just ends there. The pipeline starts out here northwest of the Speedway and runs 12 miles out to Apex, where it will provide water to this otherwise dry part of the industrial park. Remember the Faraday Future Project? For North Las Vegas, it was a way to get infrastructure improvements underway to make Apex more attractive to other large industries. Though Faraday failed, improvements like the widening of US-93 are underway. But the water problem still hadn't been solved. That is, until Weston Adams stepped in. And we uh, decided to join forces and build this water line, and we're super excited about it. Adams planned to spend more than $6 million to run a water line out to a large piece of property his company bought at Miners Mesa. North Las Vegas asked him to make it larger, and they're paying the remaining $42 million to run the pipe out to Apex. The result? A chance to get that money back and then some by expanding the tax base. The revenue, the tax base, those are very important things for schools, for the state of Nevada, and for the residents of North Las Vegas. Well, work on that pipeline is scheduled to be wrapped up in 2020. The city's projecting some 20,000 jobs could be housed out at Apex once all of it is built out. Yeah, that's good news for North Las Vegas. Well, up next, cutting through the confusion. I think you can definitively say that rates will go down. One of Question 3's biggest advocates makes his case for why it would cut energy costs. That's next on Politics Now.
instantly at One Nevada. Welcome back to Politics Now. Well, if you're watching TV very much, this shouldn't surprise you. More money is being spent on Question 3, the Energy Choice Initiative, than any other ballot measure in the entire history of Nevada. All of those ads, however, creating a lot of confusion about it, what it would actually do. Right. You probably saw one during this broadcast. The former chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, that's John Wellinghoff, is now a big proponent of Question 3. He's with Nevadans for Clean Energy Choices. That's the group behind the initiative. I talked to Wellinghoff about some of the major issues with Question 3. The number one thing that I think probably consumers are worried about is prices. What That's impact correct. will this have on prices? Is it going to lower my bill? Is it going to raise my bill? Um, some of the people who have looked at that have come up with the answer of we can't say or it depends. Um, I see the only certainty I really see is in the ads. No says no, it's definitely going to raise your prices. Yes says no, it will lower your prices. What's the truth? Well, I think we have two data points, Steve, that will tell you that it will lower your bills overall. Number one is, on average, states that have competition have lowered bills by 14%, where states that have monopolies like we do with NV Energy, their bills have gone up 5%. And that's mm -hmm. data actually from the Energy Information Administration. Administration. Secondly, we did our own study here, and I used one of the analysts that is uh, well known in Nevada, and actually a um, analyst from um, Oklahoma who works all over the country analyzing utility rates and utility rate structures, and he determined that actually there's over $1.1 billion in savings that would happen almost immediately once we went to energy choice based upon the structure of the utility and some of the money, in essence, that they would have to give back that they're retaining now, that they would have to give back to consumers. So if you take those two data points, the study that we've done and what the EIA says, I think you can definitively say that rates will go down. NV Energy has existing power contracts, and, and those contracts will either have to be renegotiated, uh, they'll have to be assigned uh, to other people, or in the cases where they can't be assigned, somebody's going to have to pay uh, for those contracts and the, and the rates there. Would that have an effect on consumer prices? No, because we have to pay for those contracts now. Mm -hmm. So that's not going to change. Those contracts will still have to be honored one way or the other by consumers so ultimately it's not going to change the situation going forward of whether or not we would have to pay those contracts because we still are under the obligation whether or not we put choice in place so those are separate the lowering of rates will come from these monies that NV Energy has kept in deferred taxes and also will come from competition itself. One of the criticisms that I've heard of, of this uh, initiative is that it's being done by constitutional amendment, yes. the only state in the nation that has done it by constitutional amendment. Why do it by constitutional amendment as opposed to doing it through statute? Well, I'll tell you, when I was chairman of FERC, there was a utility, a uh, national utility, that serves primarily in the southeast called Southern Company. Mm. And we used to call Southern Company a lobbying company that, ha ap <laughs> that happened to serve energy. <laughs> NV Energy is like that in the, in the Nevada legislature. When you walk through the Nevada legislature, every other person there is an NV Energy lobbyist. So to get this done, we really need to take it to the people and make it as simple as possible and then give a directive to the legislature to put the structure in place. And that's exactly what we've done here. Yeah. We've done it in a way that the people can say, yes, we want choice. And once that's done, then the legislature can put the meat on the bones and make it work. I also asked Wellinghoff about the issues like the fact of question three on clean energy. You can watch that interview and an ad check I did on one of the ads that's out right now on LasVegasNow.com. And stay tuned to Channel 8 and Politics Now for more of our reporting on question three. Yeah, last week we had kind of the other side as well on. It's something that we're spending a lot of time on because really this is an issue that in some form or fashion all Nevadans interact with it and, and deal with Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Nevada has always had a state-granted uh, monopoly to provide electricity, which makes sense because over the last hundred years, it was incredibly expensive to build power plants and lines and substations and all, all of those things. Uh, but now we've reached a point where technology has allowed uh, a, a concept like energy choice to become possible, and, and that's why I think we're seeing the initiative. Well, a new dynamic in the attorney general race I think the way he's come about it is very honest. And I think the blemish is significant. Face-off panel weighs in on the story Steve broke last week. Candidate Aaron Ford's college arrest in the 90s and what it will mean in the race.
Plus, the school district starts drafting its bill requests for the legislature, including one that will not make employee unions very happy. We'll tell you about it next on Politics Now. watching Politics Now. Well, last week on the show, we aired an interview with Democratic Attorney General candidate Aaron Ford, where he admitted to four arrests during his college days in Texas in the early 1990s. You can watch that on LasVegasNow.com. This week, we asked our face-off panel how those revelations will affect the Attorney General's race. Here's KXNT radio host Alan Stock and Battleborn Progress Deputy Director Maria Teresa Lieberman. Does this doom his uh, quest to be attorney general for Nevada? Uh, it's definitely a blemish on his record. The point is, is that he had problems when he was younger. You would say a lot of people have gone through things in their lives, uh, and they've overcome things. It, he went through those four arrests. We don't know if there are any more, but he, those four arrests. And as he got older, you know, he had problems then with paying taxes. Now, other people who are attorneys, uh, and I think with it, even in the same firm, paid their adequate taxes. He had some problems keeping that all straight. Um, I, I, it questions whether or not he should be the top law enforcement official. An elected state senator, an elected assemblyman, something like that, perhaps. But, uh, but an elected uh, attorney general uh, enforcing the law when he's got his own issues about skirting the law, basically. Um, you know, I, I think it's a, that's going to be a question in people's minds. Had this not come out, I think the, the, uh, that race would have been tighter. I think that this weighs a little more against him for having done something like this. Hmm. What do you think? I think that, you know, it, is it a blemish? Sure, it is. It would be a blemish on anyone's uh, uh, record. However, I think the way he's come about it is very honest. If so other candidates have had things in their past, like current Attorney General Adam Laxalt, and he owns up to his, his past, etc. I think as we go further and more candidates candidates that have, are getting elected into um, office that resemble um, the communities that they come from and have past that they're owning up to it. I think it's, it's a good thing, honestly. If you do have a blemish and you own up to it and you take responsibility, I think everyday people will see that and realize that, you know, sort of they're just like us type of thing, that um, as long as you're not hiding it and you're owning up to it, um, that's, you know, people will be accepting of that. As long as you're responsible going forward, I, I think everybody's human and we have uh, our pasts and, and 
I think we, it, that shouldn't discourage people from, if they want higher office, continuing to go to higher office. But then, as Alan pointed out, most of us are not running to be the state's chief law enforcement officer Yeah. Uh, w w with that. Is this disqualifying, you think? No, I don't mm -hmm. think it is disqualifying. There, there's nothing that says you, you can't. Um, I, I think he should, he should go forward. And at the end of the day, the people that will decide are the people that are going to cast their ballots um, this year. With uh, Ford, again, you have four arrests not one, but four, and then you have when he's older and he is and he's in the Senate, uh, the state Senate. He's uh, he's skirting paying the full amount of taxes that he that he should have paid, and yet he, he's blaming somebody else. He, I think he blamed somebody else for his arrests too. That it was because he was a single mom, and it was always somebody else's issue instead of owning up to it and taking um, well, taking responsibility. Be, Does it disqualify him for being the AG? may not disqualify him, but again, I think the blemish is significant, and I think people will, when they go into that voting booth, decide just how significant it really is. Alan and Maria Teresa also debated Danny Tarkanian threatening another defamation lawsuit, the divides within both political parties, and the recent voter fraud investigation in Nevada. Go to LasVegasNow.com and look for political news under the News tab. Patrick? All right, Steve, this is The Race Now, where we talk about some of the other big news happening this week. The campaign for Democratic uh, Nevada Attorney General Aaron Ford says it did some polling that shows a 5% edge on Republican candidate Wes Duncan. However, there is a caveat. That poll was taken from June 19th, or rather July 19th through the 25th. That was just days before Ford came on to 8 News Now to talk about his four arrests during college in the 90s. Of course, Steve broke that story last Friday, July 27th. Nevada Republican Senator Dean Heller may have some unexpected support for his No Budget, No Pay Act. Democratic Congressional District 3 candidate Susie Lee has tweeted that there's talk of another government shutdown over the budget and that she would support a No Budget, No Pay Act. That concept withholds pay from lawmakers until they pass a budget bill. And school district trustees came up with a couple of bill draft requests for the next legislative session. We believe that we need to have a larger ending fund balance in order to be fiscally responsible um, and make sure that we can take care of any expenses that might come up. Well, that ending fund balance is basically a rainy day fund to help the district get through some hard times. Their bill request would protect it from negotiations and arbitrations with the labor union. The second bill would give teachers tools to help kids dealing with trauma at home. That one is called, the handle, is called Handle with Care. So, Steve, the labor unions, they're going to be fighting pretty hard to kill that BDR request from the school district, I would assume. Oh, I would definitely uh, bet on that. Uh, I mean, part of the reason that the unions are able to win these concessions when they go to arbitration is because that money is just sitting there in an account, and they can point to it and say, well, the district can pay. And part of the reason that the, uh, the or part of the criteria the arbitrator uses to decide what uh, is mo more fair is that ability to pay and as long as that's in the law I think we're going to see that. Well Nevada's poker rooms are seeing a resurgence. We'll tell you all about that coming up next on Politics Now.
2 7 a.m. on 8 News Now. You're watching Politics Now. Well, Nevada's poker rooms had a banner month in June. It was the second highest revenue total ever. Yeah, that was for a single month in the state's history, making $17.5 million. It's about $150,000 below the previous record. That was set back in June of 07. More than $14 million of that coming from the Strip. Online poker is also included in that figure. The reason June is such a big month in general is because the World Series of Poker, of course, is played right here in Las Vegas. Those tournaments, however, are not included in that total. All right, this is What to Watch, where we tell you about what we are keeping an eye on next week. The Lake Tahoe Summit is on Tuesday. It's hosted this year by Senator Dean Heller. Senators from Nevada, California, and a slew of federal officials will be there. It's an opportunity for the two states to keep getting federal funding to keep Lake Tahoe clean. Also, the Henderson City Council has a few interesting items on their agenda. They'll be swearing in the new city attorney, and CCSD Superintendent Jesus Jara will be there to speak to the city council as well. And Steve, you're also looking at voter registration numbers. Yeah, actually, the, uh, the voter registration, the, uh, the, the rate of gain that the Democrats have been having in the last few months kind of slowed. Uh, it's, uh, it's down to uh, three figures now instead of four figures. And so if they keep going at this rate, I think they'll probably have around 71,000 more uh, active registered voters on Election Day than do the Republicans. So that's an important number to, to, uh, to keep watching. Well, that's our show. Thanks for watching Politics Now. You can email the both of us, just our first initial and last name at LasVegasNow.com. Stay up to date online and watch us right here every Saturday.